Greetings, this is Kurt Alt with the Wild Sheep Foundation. I'm the conservation director for both Montana and international programs. I first want to provide a bit of background for this seminar. In September 2019, the Wild Sheep Foundation hosted the 7th World Mountain Ungula Conference near our headquarters in Bozeman, Montana. It's the first time this conference was ever held in North America, and it was jointly funded by both us, the Wild Sheep Foundation, and SCI Foundation. As a member of IUCN ourselves, this conference brought together the world's Capernet wild sheep, wild goat expertise to share research findings, management applications, and conservation actions on wild sheep and wild goats worldwide. Our presentations today are but one outgrowth of this conference and are designed to help develop a better understanding of the practices surrounding conservation and management of Capernet species. Our first two presenters, Dr. Marco Festa, Banquet from Canada and Stefan Michel from Germany are both members of the IUCN Capernet Species Specialist Group and they're going to describe species assessments performed by this IUCN group and their relevance to IUCN red lists, CITES and other laws and they're going to be providing examples from both North America and Central Asia. Our third presenter, Michelle Turton, is a biologist with the U.S. CITES Management Authority and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you, Kurt. Um, so my name is Marco Festa Bianchet. I work at the Department of Biology at the University of Sherbrooke. And uh, today I'm going to present something about what is an endangered species, something that we hear a lot about these days. How do we determine uh, what is an endangered species and what are the consequences of different types of uh, listing, but I'll insist more on the scientific determination of the level of uh, endangerment. So I spent, uh, great. Okay. I spent uh, about the last 40 years or so working on the behavioral ecology and the evolution ecology of various species of mammals. Uh, some of which you see here in the picture, mostly uh, with mountain angulate in uh, Europe and uh, North America. I've also uh, worked in the Committee on the States of Endangered Species in Canada. I was the chair of the committee for uh, four years, between 2002 and 2006. And this is the body in Canada that does the scientific uh, assessment of species for possible listing in uh, Canada Species at Risk Act. And that is where most of my knowledge, uh, most of my experience with the assessment of uh, uh, endangered species uh, uh, comes from. I was also for 16 years uh, the chair of the IUCN Caprina Specialist Group, so the Mountain Angular Specialist Group of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And during that time, among other things, uh, our uh, specialist group uh, was one of uh, the ones that initiated and really promoted uh, this, uh, the guiding principle on trophy hunting, uh, which really has become the uh, basic document that IUCN uses to determine what is conservation hunting and what are the criteria and the characteristics of a hunting program that really allow it to contribute uh, uh, to conservation. And this document has been used a lot uh, to distinguish between hunting programs that do and do not contribute to uh, conservation. So uh, before we get into the definitions and the consequences of uh, uh, these uh, assessment, one question I think is important to ask is why do we protect species? Uh, you know, we all know that in most cases, the problem is habitat. So why do we go after endangered species and not endangered habitats? Well, one reason is simply a legal reason. It's a lot easier to define what is a species than what is a habitat. Uh, we could get into very long arguments about the legal and taxonomic uh, problem of defining a species, but still, it becomes a lot easier to define uh, what is, let's say, a Florida panther as opposed to its habitat. And also, to some extent, uh, species tend to have more charisma uh, than habitats. Uh, people like to see polar bears rather than being told about the Arctic uh, ecosystem. People like to see bighorn sheep rather than being told about mountain mm -hmm. habitat. So those are the two main reasons, I think, why we tend to leave species. But we have to remember that if we want to protect species, we have to target the cause of endangerment. And for terrestrial mammals, that is typically, uh, that typically requires habitat protection. 
most endangered mammal are endangered because of habitat problem. Not only there is some cases, uh, for example, in mountain ungulates where disease uh, is uh, the problem. In some cases it's introduced uh, species. Uh, in some cases it's over harvest, but typically we're looking at habitat. So we really want to identify species in danger, but to protect them, we need to protect their habitat. So how did we get here? How long has the idea of endangered species uh, been around? Um, it's been around for quite a while and probably the first attempt to really formalize this process was by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The back in 1964 came up with the first version of what they call the red list, so a list of endangered species. Now it's important to understand that this is just a list. We'll go over some of the consequences later, but it's essentially a tool to inform everyone that this species is endangered, that species is not. The US was the first country, I believe, that came up with an actual law to protect endangered species. And um, it's always kind of interesting to realize that this was actually promulgated during the uh, Nixon administration. And as many of you know, the real motivation behind it was that iconic species were disappearing, the bald eagle, the grizzly bear, the peregrine falcon. And that's why this law got through and it has had enormous consequences for conservation and management since then, because it is a strong law. It protects the habitat, it has real consequences. In Canada and in many other countries, it was a long time before people got uh, their act together and had endangered species legislation. So for example, in Canada, we did not have a species risk act until um, 30 years later in 2003, and possibly because politicians saw the consequences of the ESA that the law in Canada is very weak. It does not automatically protect habitat. It only applies to land under direct control of the federal uh, government. But if we have these laws, we have to know what endanger mean. And I think that is one of the problems that I think a lot of the public thinks that endanger means, <clears throat> excuse me, thinks that endanger is a species it's about to go extinct. Uh, you know, Vancouver Island marmot when they were down to 20, uh, Florida panther when they were down to only about a dozen. What is the definition of endanger? What is the scientific definition of endanger? Well, the US Endangered Species Act doesn't use a strong quantitative criterion to specify endanger. It essentially says that endanger means that the species is in, in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. What is the definition used by, by uh, the IUCN? The IUCN is, uh, the, it's a quantitative definition. So a species is in danger if it has a probability of going extinct in the wild of at least 20% within, uh, within, within uh, 20 years or five generation, uh, whichever is longer, uh, up to maximum 100 years. So this is a quantitative definition. And as you can see, it englobes a whole lot, a much wider range of species than uh, something like, you know, something that's down to last few that is gonna go extinct over the next year. It has a long time horizon of 20 years or five generations. And it estimates it requires a probability of extinction in the wild of about 20%, which means 80% probability of the species will not go extinct. And this definition is there because extinction is so terrible for conservation, it's so irremediable, they would really want to avoid it. Now, a couple of things that are important here. What are generations? What is the definition of generation? This is something that a lot of people, including a lot of biologists get confused. A generation simply refers to the average age of parents. So if you wanna calculate the generation time of a species, you need to know the age of uh, the parents of the individuals that are alive now, and that is your generation time. So for bacon sheep, it's probably about seven years. For an unhunted population, it's something like, uh, of grizzly bears, it's something like about 12 years. So it's the average age uh, of parents. And the reason why IUCN and all these criteria use generation, because obviously the same rate, uh, the same decline for a species like uh, a mouse that has a short generation time over say one or two years is not as uh, worrisome as a, a similar decline for a species like a grizzly bear or an elephant. So generation time is something that is really important. It is not 
the age of first individuals first reproduced. It is not lifespan, it's the average age of parents. And this is a, uh, an ingredient of almost all the definitions and criteria that UCN uses. There's an obvious problem here. When you read the definition from a UCN, probability of extinction of at least 20% within 20 years of five generation, a species doesn't go 20% extinct. Extinction either happens or it doesn't. So what we're trying to do is estimate the risk, estimate the probability. But in reality, the species of interest will go extinct or not. But I just wanted to mention how um, relatively large is this definition, 20% within 20 years. Uh, and again, it's because we really don't want species to go extinct. What are the criteria that we use to determine that the species is uh, in danger? Well, uh, the US Endangered Species Act does not have specific quantitative criteria. It has a list of uh, criteria such as habitat loss, uh, um, various threats that can be used for listing, but they are not very uh, quantitative. Essentially, every time the US Fish and Wildlife or whatever agency, agency is responsible, looks at the evidence and tries to determine if a species is in danger or threatened. The IUCN, however, started developing quantitative criteria beginning in 1991. Now, I'd like to point out that here the goal is the same. We are trying to assess probability of extinction. We are using the information that we have from biology of what are the characteristics that make it so that the species is in danger. But the IUCN has quantitative criteria, which makes it a little, busy, a little easier to assess the status of uh, each species. And these criteria uh, were developed mostly thanks to the work of uh, uh, Professor Georgina Mays, who unfortunately died uh, last year. And there is five of these criteria. They're all based on things that you can easily connect with the risk of extinction, a decline in numbers, uh, threats to the habitat, uh, extent of occurrence. So if a species has a very small distribution and it's only found in one or two places, clearly it's more likely to be endangered than a widespread species. Uh, fragmentation of the habitat, so effects on genetics, uh, potential for disease, and threats. Uh, just to give an example, when I was in Kosiwe, the Committee on the States to Endanger Wildlife in Canada, we assessed as uh, endangered a population of uh, stickleback, uh, uh, little fish, on a lake in British Columbia, there were no problems with the lake, except in every other lake, somebody had introduced uh, exotic catfish, which completely eliminate uh, the population of stickleback. So clearly there was a threat, clearly that population was in danger. Let's look at an example. Uh, probably the easiest one of the five criteria to um, consider is the decline criterion. Simply means the population is in danger if it's declining at a certain rate. The definition that UCN uses is the decline which can be observed, estimated, inferred, or suspected in the total population size is of more than 50% over the last 10 years or three generations. Again, you see the generation uh, concept comes in, whichever uh, is longer. So a couple of things. IUCN estimates risk of extinction for the whole species. So the whole population of the entire, uh, the entire species. Uh, they can do assessment for subspecies, but in generally the goal is to estimate uh, the risk of extinction for the species. So it's important to know what the species is. And uh, the decline can be observed, estimated, inferred, or suspected. And this is where you realize that the UCN is taking into account the fact that we cannot go out and count every single species. So in some cases, you may use an index of abundance. So for a lot of fishes, how many are caught during trawl surveys? Uh, for other species, if we know what the habitat is, and we know that the habitat is disappearing at a rapid rate, well, it's reasonable to infer that the species uh, is declining as well. So the threshold is more than 50% over 10 years or three generations. Now, the OCN uh, quantitative criteria are excellent for estimating uh, a level of endangerment. First of all, they're quantitative. That means that there is a quantitative guideline that tells us when is a species in danger, threatened, or uh, not a risk. And they're based on modeling and they're based on real data that say, well, if a species is declining by a certain rate, let's say 50% over three generations, it is likely that a species is a great risk of extinction. If it's surviving in only one population and is declining, that species is likely in danger. There's a quantitative basis. They're applicable to all species or plants and animals. They're based on data and on uh, science. 
and they provide a quantitative estimation of the risk of extinction, which then can be translocated or translated to these uh, categories of endangered, critically endangered or threatened. There are some problems with the uh, IUCN uh, red list. Uh, first of all, let's see, what is it look, what is it used for? As I said at the beginning of my presentation, it is just a list. It doesn't have it by itself any legal implications, but because it is based on science, because the IUCN uh, is a very large organization with a large number of scientists with a very, very strong uh, and well-deserved reputation for scientific leadership, people, uh, organization, governments look up to the IUCN. So the red list is used often to guide uh, national policy, to guide research. There is more and more papers that are coming out where people look at, well, what are species are in danger, what are not, and what are the characteristics of endangered species compared to species that are not in danger. And it's often used as a basis for national uh, legislation. So for example, if something is listed, red listed by the HCN in Canada, we definitely would have a look at what is the status of that animal uh, or of that species in Canada. And the information is often fed into uh, CITES, the Convention International uh, Trade of Endangered Species. So far, so good. What are some of the problems? Well, one is the way the assessments are done, which essentially rely on the specialist group, which like almost everything else in IUCN is a bunch of volunteers. So for example, uh, when uh, the Caprina specialist group is asked to assess mountain angulate, it's essentially just told, go ahead and do it. Uh, when I was chair of COSIWIC and I would ask somebody to assess the status of let's say woodland caribou, I, I would run a competition and here's a $30,000 contract. So people could actually spend time uh, organizing and gathering uh, the information. So even though the criteria are great, some of the assessments are based on uh, fairly limited uh, information because sometimes the information is available, but it would take you know, three weeks of work to put it together. Another problem that many specialist group, including the Caprini specialist group are trying to work to change is that in the identification of threats, we often see hunting, but the way IUCN uses hunting, it essentially means any kind of take. So it could be legal sport hunting, it could be poaching, it could be subsistence hunting for bush meat. Uh, and that is an issue because public will read the uh, assessment and see, oh, hunting is a problem. Well, no, poaching is a problem or commercial hunting is a problem. And in many cases, uh, sport hunting is part of the solution because it can raise money for conservation. But if you look at the assessment, it is just presented uh, as a problem. So this is something that we really need to work with. Having said all that, let's uh, uh, look at an example. And let's look at an example of a North American species, which is clearly not at risk. And the definition that I use and uses for not at risk is least concern. So uh, this year I updated uh, the status report uh, for the species. And in a case like the mountain goat, it's fairly easy to do a status report because the information is readily available from management agencies. It's only found in two, uh, in two countries, most of which have uh, quite good uh, fish and wildlife uh, agencies. So why is the species least concerned? Well, if we look at the population criteria, there is no real evidence of a decline, of an ongoing decline. The population is stable uh, over the entire range of the species, and there is somewhere in the order of 48 to 62,000 mature individuals. Now, another little aspect of IUCN uh, uh, assessment is important. We count the number of mature individuals. For something like mountain goats, that wouldn't make a huge difference, but if you think of something like a fish, take salmon, you don't want to count the number of fries in the population size, otherwise you'll be immediately in the millions. And in some cases, you know, 99% of those uh, of those newly hatched fries will die. So IUCN counts the number of individuals that are mature, which means they're able to reproduce. Population is not severely fragmented. There's no continuing decline. And uh, there is no other characteristics that could increase uh, the risk of endangerment. Uh, there's no extreme fluctuation. There's no continuing decline in number of population, et cetera. So here is a little description where I uh, say, well, we had somewhere between 43,000 and 70,000 uh, in Canada and 37 to 47,000 in the States. And 
the assessment does point out that some historic range in the southern part of the distribution are now unoccupied. And uh, there was some over harvest of mountain goat in the past before people realized that this is not just a white bighorn sheep. And so some of these declines were actually due to uh, over harvest. And we know now that the species can only tolerate a very small amount of harvest in native populations. So what are the potential threats to this uh, species? And again, I had to say, well, one potential threat is hunting because there is a take. But as you see in the description of the threats, uh, these animals are largely protected from threats because the accessible nature of the habitat and there's regulation in both of its range states, Canada and the US, uh, that have stabilized past decline. In other words, the hunt is totally uh, is sustainable. What is an increasing threat is that these animals are very sensitive to uh, human disturbance and the increasing use of helicopter for skiing, barbecuing, sun sunsets, seeing, etc., a resource exploration uh, is a major concern for the conversation, con for the conservation. Another way of saying, again, habitat is the key to the conservation of this animal. Another ongoing threat is probably climate change, which we see for many mountain ungulate. Um, but really, currently, the main threat is uh, uh, disturbance. So that's all that I had to tell you. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll over to uh, uh, Dan, who is uh, experienced actually in Central Asia where, real, uh, where the real problems are. So my name is Stefan Michel. I'm also a member of the IUCN Caprine Specialist Group. I have been working on uh, mountain ungulates among other topics in Central Asia since 1993 about, but more intensively than 2008 when I started to work on community-based conservation and sustainable use of mountain ungulates in Tajikistan. I am currently assisting the IOCN Caprina Specialist Group in my capacity as Red List uh, Authority Coordinator. This means that I am assisting in uh, facilitating all those volunteer experts in doing the assessments of the Red list status of the Caprine species. At the moment, we have done about 20 something out of the 30 plus species of Caprine. And I will briefly present some uh, specifics on uh, Mahor, Asiatic Mouflon, and Uriel as those species which I worked on most intensively during the last years. So, one second. So first uh, on Mahor, which is quite a famous uh, species of Caprine, uh, very famous uh, because of the high priced hunts. And this uh, species consists of, cur of currently three recognized subspecies, uh, the flare-horned Mahor, mainly distributed in northern Pakistan and in uh, northeastern Afghanistan. The straight horn Mahor, famous from the Tora Mountains in uh, southwestern Pakistan, in Baluchistan. And Hepnos or Bukhara or Tajik Mahor, which is uh, limited to some minor areas in the former Soviet Union at the border between Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan uh, and in Tajikistan, as well as probably some small relics in Afghanistan. Uh, you see here also the maps as they are presented in the IOCN Red List, uh, which are distinguishing different categories of presence in certain areas, extant, possibly extant, possibly extinct, extinct and presence uncertain. The Maho had been listed as endangered in 1996 and 2008 under yeah, one criterion which refers to the number of uh, mature individuals and the uh, continuing decline rate, which was supposed to be uh, more than 20% over two generations with a generation length estimated at seven years. There was also considered another criterion that the subpopulations are severely fragmented and it was supposed that all subpopulations are smaller than 250 mature individuals and that there is a continuing decline. But 
the interesting thing is that local improvements were already uh, uh, visible at this time and it was thinkable that another category might have been applicable. Uh, as an example, here's some data from uh, Tora, the uh, first area where community-based hunting management uh, led to a documented increase or recovery in the population. And it is uh, obvious that uh, already during the 1990s, an increase happened there. Uh, during the 2014 reassessment, the species actually switched by two categories to near threatened to the best uh, category, uh, second best category. And this is obvious uh, that there had been a miscalculation in the 2008 assessment, a so called non genuine improvement would have been applicable, and the actual uh, applicable uh, category would have been vulnerable already in 2014. Uh, it seems that the population in uh, Tora in Baluchistan of north uh, south uh, western Pakistan had not been considered in the calculation of the population size and also that uh, this population was even above a threshold of 1000 mature individuals. Further, there had been a genuine improvement that we could show that the decline was halted and that the population had actually increased uh, substantially over the years, and this concerned all three recognized subspecies. There had been quite some uh, opposition among some experts to this so-called downlisting. But uh, this was partly due to the misperception that the change of the category would have a legal consequence. But as Marco explained, uh, the IOCN red list is not a legal category. It is just an objective uh, estimation of an extinction risk in the future. There had been quite some challenges for the assessment of Capra Falconeri or Maho. Uh, one is that there had been local improvements which were well documented, but other sub subpopulations were much less known. So there had been uh, a fear that actually local improvements may hide a large scale decline. However, the periods of comparison are uh, depending on criteria and category, one to three generations in the past, uh, which in the case of Maho would be up to uh, about 20 plus years. And in case of Maho, the lower of the population had been already in the 1980s. So a likely higher population in the first half of the 20th century or so would not be considered in the calculation of population declines. And of course, another problem is that there's insufficient knowledge for some periods and areas which make a comparison uh, for different time periods very difficult. This, for instance, concern the area at the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, where we have the around Kabul, and we had some uh, Maho in the past, and in Nuristan, we had a more recent confirmation that the species is still present there. Another issue is uh, the, that the IUCN red list includes several schemes on habitat factors on threats and different, different things which are used for uh, doing meta assessments. So there are then publications made which would uh, say that XYZ percent of endangered species have, for instance, in this case, hunting or harvest as a threat. And this is, of course, misleading as poaching and hunting are quite different things. It makes it a big difference if uh, a large number of the species is uh, harvested in an unregulated way uh, without benefiting local communities, without ownership, without regulation, or if a few animals are harvested in the course of sport hunting, benefiting communities and motivating conservation. And we have made attempts calling IUCN to uh, differentiate those uh, threat categories more, but unfortunately so far no change was applied. And this is quite diff difficult because the same types, the same categories are applied to all plant and animal species across the world. And so it is quite diff difficult to make changes to such an established system.
The status of Marho is, of course, heavily dependent on effective conservation measures. Uh, uh, small changes, uh, small uh, pr uh, problems in po small parts of the area, being it political uh, problems or being uh, the reduction of hunting tourism due to the corona pandemics now can actually uh, make the species uh, threatened or endangered again. It's in particular important that incentives are generated by sustainable hunting programs, which benefit the local communities. Uh, the picture above, you see the just the meat, but uh, the same uh, Maho yielded an amount of money which allowed for the building of eight new houses for families which had been evacuated after a natural disaster. Uh, Maho is listed in Appendix 1 of CITES, and this requires that import permits are issued by the countries where the hunters originate from, and those permits allow for effective control for inquiries to the range states, for inquiries to independent experts, and thus put pressure that actually the requirements are fulfilled, that the hunting is beneficial for the conservation of the species and is beneficial also for the local communities. I now come to two other species which are less famous and uh, for many years uh, there had been issues with the taxonomy and probably they are still. And uh, in the recent IUCN uh, assessment, uh, in 2020, we managed to apply a concept which had been suggested already by a taxonomy workshop of the IUCN Caprine specialist group in 2000, 20 years ago. And this means splitting of previous wild sheep Ovis orientalis into uh, Ovis gmelini, the Asiatic mufflon, and Ovis vignei. Uh, the Uriel because of morphological and genetic distinctiveness of those species. And actually uh, the common names for almost all populations of these sheep of either Mouflon or Uriel. And uh, so the hunters and uh, yeah, the knowing public actually uh, distinguished these species uh, for all the time, but because of the naturally occurring hybrids, they have been lumped together. This uh, assessment showed that the uh, uh, mufflon would fit into the near threatened category, while the Uriel uh, remains uh, vulnerable because of a suspected faster decline than the mufflon. Yeah, here the range maps of both species, uh, the left one, the Mufflon range map and the right one, the Uriel range map and the uh, gray shaded areas are the uh, shown as presence uncertain. This are, these are the hybrid zones, which cannot be attributed to one or the other of the two species. The European mufflon is not considered in this context because this is a feral domestic sheep and belongs to Ovis aries, and uh, those feral uh, animals are not part of the IUCN red list assessment. Uh, just recently, the dingo has been removed from the red list, which had in the past been seen as a distinct conservation unit, but is no longer recognized by IUCN. The Cyprus mouflon is possibly a descent of early introduced Asiatic mouflon. Uh, according to Cypriotic scientists, there is no real evidence that this had been a uh, domesticated animal in the past, and there is no history of domestication on Cyprus. So uh, also considering its legal status uh, in certain legislations, uh, it was taken as a wild subspecies. But uh, subspecies are often difficult to distinguish, and some countries apply differing names for actually the same animals, like Iran and Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. The Asiatic mufflon and uh, Uriel or Vizvigny, they are the overall population sizes are in the 10,000s. Uh, very difficult to assess this because most species have their largest populations in Iran and uh, assessments are available only for protected areas and their reliability may vary. And there might also be a motivation of protected area stuff actually to blow up the numbers a bit. Outside of Iran, most populations are small, uh, often unknown, but some subpopulations are stable or increasing. 
Threats to both species are poaching, including the capture of uh, lambs as pets, the habitat degradation for and uh, forage competition with livestock, possibly also uh, disease transmission. And both species have a good potential for sustainable use for creating conservation incentives, but there are also risks that uh, animals might be overused for creating short-term benefits. And there are also attempts of doing high fence breeding and sometimes in those breeding areas, non-native uh, Uriel or Mufflon or even European Mufflon are kept together with the native animals and thus is a high risk of hybridizing which if those animals may escape can lead to the genetic pollution and the loss of the wild populations. A brief excurs to Cytus, uh, currently uh, Cyprus mouflon and Ladakh Uriel are in Appendix 1 which means that there is strict protection and no commercial use is permitted but uh, sport hunting trophies can be taken uh, if import and export perm permits are uh, obtained. And Appendix 2, uh, which requires regulation of trade and then export permit from the exporting countries is sufficient for most countries. But uh, there are quite some difficulties because of uh, sometimes unclear attribution of populations to subspecies. And in particular, the status of the hybrid populations in Iran is not really defined. And uh, the current interpretation by um, some CITES authorities, which I had uh, called uh, ahead of this presentation, suggested that they should be treated as being listed under Appendix 2 because of the parent species of his Vignae being listed under Appendix 2. So hunting trophies of those hybrid uh, sheep would require an export permit from the exporting country. Uh, another difficulty is that site has changed the taxonomic concepts within 10 years, three times. Before 2017, the Cyprus mouflon was a subspecies of Ovis orientalis and Uriel was treated as a distinct species with several subspecies. In 2017, then both species were lumped under the name of domestic sheep, Ovis arius, which caused a lot of confusion and uh, so mixed actually the uh, wild sheep with uh, yeah, feral and domestic sheep. And since 2019, the phylogenetic species concept is applied and uh, this led to the splitting of Uriel into three different species and Mouflon is, still, is now seen also as a different species with only one subspecies being listed. This all causes difficulties for legal sustainable use and for the enforcement. It causes a lot of confusion. Hunters get into trouble. On the other hand, uh, some trophies might actually be obtained and imported uncontrolled. So a potential solution might be that CITES may align the taxonomy with IUCN, as we had uh, suggested as IUCN Caprina specialist groups for several times already. And possibly it might be useful to list all Asiatic Mouflon, Uriel and hybrid populations in the same appendix at the same regulations would apply to all of them. A few words about the role of hunting tourism. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, the most important is uh, that uh, regulated hunting provides incentives to prevent poaching and to preserve the habitat. And there is a, quite a number of requirements which should be fulfilled for realizing these benefits. Most important is clear responsibility and ownership for the areas where the hunting takes place and for the animals in those areas. Preferably those uh, responsibilities should be with local communities, but there are also commercial entities which have shown a great level of commitment and success. Revenues need to benefit uh, the local communities because uh, against uh, local people which feel alienated, it is almost impossible to protect an animal and its habitat. People would poach, would, in, uh, would uh, 
uh, conquer the land, use it for livestock breeding in excess, and thus uh, the habitat would be destroyed. So revenues benefiting local communities uh, is a key issue. There should be population monitoring, which involves independent experts. And this is really a tricky issue because uh, we have seen also attempts of falsification of uh, monitoring data by hunting uh, entities, which hope for uh, increase in quotas and for fast uh, financial benefits. And it is often not easy for an outsider uh, to judge about this uh, situation in an area and uh, to uh, stand for an independent and realistic number. Quota setting needs to be responsible, or I may say conservative, that evolutionary consequences of trophy hunting, of taking the largest animals are minimized. Uh, animals should have a chance of getting old and for successful hunting and for maintaining the evolutionary processes the best would be if only about 20% of really old aged uh, trophy animals would be taken and the rest would actually be allowed to die naturally. And effective conservation programs need to be in place. These don't need to be always formal programs, don't need to be always programs implemented by an external agency or organization. Those programs can also be implemented by the actual managers of the game management areas. There are, of course, also risks related to the trophy hunting. Uh, a, a big issue is a late capture of access and revenues that influential people may try to capture areas and to sell animals uh, for yeah, short term financial gains. There might be manipulated hunts with animals being staged or just released from a fenced area. There had been even reports of uh, manipulated trophies. Uh, if this happens, uh, local people are alienated and actually are stimulated to poach. And this all together leads to population declines. This example is actually a picture from the internet of a hunt uh, in Tajikistan 2011. By all my knowledge, Tajikistan did not have a quota in 2011. And uh, it was not a CITES member. And certainly, it was not possible to export a trophy. But nevertheless, this uh, trophy is inserted in the SCI, Safari Club International Record Book. So this would be also, of course, a responsibility of the hunters organizations or hunting associations to care that their members or others cannot enter illegal or doubtful trophies into their record books and get fame for this. But finally, it's the hunter's choice. The hunters should go for hunts with clear benefits for conservation local communities. They should refrain from doubtful offers illegal hunts, manipulated hunts, captive hunts. Uh, I have uh, often heard of hunters who were actually offered during hunting a non-endangered species if they want to pay some several thousand dollars and take a, on the way an endangered one or take a second trophy or something like this. And it would be important that hunters make inquiries to outfitters, to other hunters and the conservation organizations uh, about where they go, uh, share their experiences, and by this actually put pressure that sustainable practices are supported, practices which cons uh, support conservation and support local community development, while illegal, unsustainable practices are by this way taken out from the market. Yeah, uh, I hope that uh, in the future we can see those magnificent animals in yeah, big and large populations is also a big uh, an issue for the hunter to report. Did he only see the actual one animal which he took finally, or was he able to observe large groups of the target species? This is often quite an indication of the status of the populations. So I hope that further improvement of the status of these species can be supported through sustainable hunting tourism in well-managed game management areas. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Michelle Turton. I'm a biologist with the U.S. CITES Management Authority and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and today I will be talking about permitting the importation of trophies into the United States. Before we begin, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I have a bachelor's degree in zoology from The Ohio State University. I also have a master's in environmental science with a concentration of applied ecology and conservation from Miami University. My research during my, my graduate <laughs> research was on distance sampling to estimate population density of ungulates. I've been with US Fish and Wildlife Service for over five years now. I started working as a wildlife biologist in our refuges program with Upper Mississippi River National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. And I've now been with International Affairs for over two years. I also love the outdoors. I love doing activities from hunting and fishing to hiking, backpacking, and rock climbing. To begin, we'll talk about the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Flana and Flora, better known as CITES. There are 183 parties or member countries. It was signed on March 3rd, 1973 and went into effect a few years later in 1975. It establishes a legal framework together with common procedural mechanisms for regulating and monitoring international trade in species. The purpose of CITES is to ensure that international trade in wild flora and fauna is legal and sustainable. How does CITES work? By regulating the export and re-export, import and introductory from the sea of live and dead animal, plants and their parts and derivatives. It's only for cited, CITES listed species and international trade is regulated based on a system of permits and certificates that are only issued if certain conditions are met and must be present when leaving and entering a country. There are two required CITES permit findings, the first being legal acquisition. This finding is done by a management authority to ensure that specimens on a permit have been legally acquired by the applicant. The next finding is a non-detrimental finding, also known as an NDF. This finding is done by a scientific authority. It's to ensure that the export of a specimen is not detrimental to the survival of the species in the wild, or in the case of import, that the purpose of the permit is not detrimental to the survival of the species in the wild. There are three CITES appendices. The first appendix being Appendix 1, which has around 1,000 species. These species are threatened with extinction. Due to this threat, there is no commercial trade. It requires both an import and an export permit. Appendix 2 is the largest of the appendices with around 30,000 species listed with a large portion being plant species. Species are vulnerable to over exploitation and not at risk of extinction. Commercial and non-commercial trade is allowed and permits slash certificates are required for export, but may not be required for import. So it's important to check with both the country you're exporting from and importing to on what permits that they require. Here in the United States, we require permits for export for Appendix 2 species, but no U.S. import Appendix 2 permit is necessary. The last category is Appendix 3, which has roughly around 300 species. These species were listed at the request of a country in the native range. Commercial and non-commercial trade is allowed, and permits and certificates are required for export. Here are some examples of CITES listed species. CITES listed species can be listed as a species as a whole, such as the case of the Markor, which is listed as an Appendix 1, and the Ural, which is also listed as Appendix 1. CITES listed species can also be based on population, 
which is the case with the bighorn sheep, which is an appendix two species, but only the population of Mexico. No other population is included in the appendixes. And sighty species can also be based on subspecies, which is the case for our golly, which is appendix one and appendix two. There are two subspecies that are listed as appendix one, where all other subspecies are listed as appendix two. Next, we'll dive into the U.S. Endangered Species Act of 1973, better known as ESA. The ESA aims to provide a framework to conserve and protect species that are listed as endangered and threatened along with their habitats. This includes both U.S. native and foreign listed species. For endangered species, the import and export are prohibited without permits. For threatened species, import and export are also prohibited when the threatened species has a 4D rule indicating that such prohibitions are needed for conservation of the species. US, species, U.S. Endangered Species Act of 1973 is listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. Regulations are referred to by title and part. The ESA is Title 50, Wildlife and Fisheries Part 17, which we refer to as 50 CFR 17. Uh, you'll be hearing me refer to 50 CFR 17 throughout the presentation. Under the ESA, enhancement findings are required. Before a permit may be issued, Fish and Wildlife Service must first find that the activity, in the case of this presentation, import, enhances the survival of the species in the wild. These enhancement findings are governed under two different subparts. For endangered wildlife, that's subpart C. And in this case, permits for are only issued for scientific purposes, enhancement of propagation or survival, or for incidental taking. And then for or threatened species, enhancement findings are governed under subpart D. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has revised its procedure for assessing applications uh, for certain uh, import sport hunted species. Uh, this was in response to a DC circuit court opinion. So we have withdrawn countrywide enhancement finding for a range of species across several countries. In their place, the service is making findings for trophy imports based on an application by application or case by case basis. So what are sources of information that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service considers in its evaluation of each permit? We take into account the information provided on a permit application submitted by the hunter or legal counsel or other power of attorney. We also consult with foreign governments and parties that provide relevant information for consideration, such as university researchers, peer-reviewed papers, professional hunting organizations, safari outfitters, to name a few. We also take into account information that we receive during professional meetings and conferences, such as Sheep Week. And we like to do site visits when possible. We also consider concession and operator support when available. How can an individual hunter contribute to the enhancement of hunted species? There are three key areas being location slash outfitter. So hunting in a concession or wildlife management area that contributes to conservation by reducing threats to that species and providing community incentives for conservation along with complying with harvest laws and regulations. The use of fees. So paying hunter license slash permits or making contributions that are invested in conservation and benefits the community. A little note is that longer hunts support greater financial incentives. 
and complying with harvest laws and regulations. How can individual hunting concessions, wildlife management areas support enhancement with their hunting areas or broader ecosystem? Hunting concessions can monitor populations of the hunted species. Protecting and improving the habitat of the hunted species through habitat management, creating water holes, protecting overwintering grazing sites. They can also help by reducing poaching in the area and reducing human wildlife conflict. We also encourage community investments with providing incentives for conservation and employing the local community. And of course, complying with local and country harvest laws and regulations. How can a government and other management entities contribute to enhancement? By establishing and using science-based quotas and other science-based harvest measures. Using reliable and repeatable population surveys. Investing fees received through hunting back into conservation, such as with anti-poaching methods, managing wildlife, human conflict, population monitoring, and ensuring that local communities benefit from sport hunting. Enforcing compliance with wildlife laws and regulations. And we also encourage the implementation of management plans and the use of adaptive management. Here are some examples of ESA listed species. Like with CITES, uh, ESA can have species listed based on populations, entire species, or subspecies. So for example, the Marcor is not listed as a whole species. It's list there are two subspecies that are currently listed on the Endangered Species Act. The Chilton Marcor is listed as endangered versus the straight horn markor is listed as threatened, which does have a special rule. Uriel is also listed as endangered. The Mexican big horn sheep is not listed as endangered, though it should be noted that there are two native populations of big horn sheep in the United States that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And the Argali is listed both as endangered and threatened. So let's dive a little deeper into the Argali. As a reminder, under CITES, there are two subspecies that are listed as Appendix 2, where all other subspecies are listed as Appendix 2. Under the ESA, uh, Argali are listed as endangered wherever found except for Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, and Tajikistan. The populations in these three countries are listed as threatened, and they have a special rule under 50 CFR 1740J. Under 50 CFR 1740J, Upon receiving from the governments of Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, and Tajikistan properly documented and verified certification that Argali populations in these countries are significantly large to, support, to sustain sport hunting. Two, regulating authorities have the capacity to obtain sound data on these populations. Three, Regulating authorities recognize these populations as valuable resource and have the legal and practical capacity to manage them as such. Four, the habitat of these populations is secure. Five, regulating authorities can ensure that the involved trophy has in fact been legally taken from a specific population. And six, funds from the sport hunting are applied primarily to Argali conservation. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service every year must 
receive this information from the three countries and ensure that all six conditions are met under the special rule in order to issue any import permits. So what documents does an individual hunter need to import trophy to the United States? You'll need the foreign CITES export permit since the Argali is listed as an appendix two for the subspecies that can be hunted. You'll also need a U.S. endangered species import permit, which can be applied through 3-200-21 application form. You will also need to use a designated wildlife port so your shipment can be inspected by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. For all animal products and specimens must be imported through a designated wildlife port, whether they are CITES or ESA listed. And along with this, you'll need a declaration for importation or exportation of fish and wildlife, which is also known as the 3-177 form. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening. And if you need to check a CITES species status or ESA species status, I've included a couple of links on this last slide. And if you would like to apply for a permit, you can also see the link below. Thank you again. To wrap this up, anyone having questions for the presenters can send them directly to my email address that can be found on this site. Um, I will then direct those questions to the appropriate presenters uh, for their response. And lastly, th the next World Mountain Ungulate Conference will return to Europe in September 2022 and will be held at Colonia in the uh, beautiful Italian Alps. Uh, with that, thank you and good day.